Section 17 of The Interpretation of Dreams. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lee Smalley. The Interpretation of Dreams by Sigmund Freud. Translation by A. A. Brill. Section 17. Infantile Material as Source of Dream, Part 1. As the third of the peculiarities of the dream content, we have adduced the fact, in agreement with all other writers on the subject, excepting Robert, that impressions from our childhood may appear in dreams, which do not seem to be at the disposal of the waking memory. It is, of course, difficult to decide how seldom or how frequently this occurs, because after waking the origin of the respective elements of the dream is not recognized. The proof that we are dealing with impressions of our childhood must thus be adduced objectively, and only in rare instances do the conditions favor such proof. The story is told by A. Morey as being particularly conclusive of a man who decides to visit his birthplace after an absence of twenty years. On the night before his departure, he dreams that he is in a totally unfamiliar locality, and that he there meets a strange man with whom he holds a conversation. Subsequently, upon his return home, he is able to convince himself that this strange locality really exists in the vicinity of his home, and the strange man in the dream turns out to be a friend of his dead father's who is living in the town. This is, of course, a conclusive proof that in his childhood he had seen both the man and the locality. The dream, moreover, is to be interpreted as a dream of impatience, like the dream of the girl who carries in her pocket the ticket for a concert, the dream of the child whose father has promised him an excursion to the Hamo, chapter 3, and so forth. The motives which reproduce just these impressions of childhood for the dreamer cannot, of course, be discovered without analysis. One of my colleagues who attended my lectures, and who boasted that his dreams were very rarely subject to distortion, told me that he had some time previously seen in a dream his former tutor in bed with his nurse, who had remained in the household until his eleventh year. The actual location of this scene was realized even in the dream. As he was greatly interested, he related the dream to his elder brother, who laughingly confirmed its reality. The brother said that he remembered the affair very distinctly, for he was six years old at the time. The lovers were in the habit of making him, the elder boy, drunk with beer whenever circumstances were favorable to their nocturnal intercourse. The younger child, our dreamer, at that time three years of age, slept in the same room as the nurse, but was not regarded as an obstacle. In yet another case, it may be definitely established, without the aid of dream interpretation, that the dream contains elements from childhood, namely, if the dream is a so-called perennial dream, one which, being first dreamt in childhood, recurs again and again in adult years. I may add a few examples of this sort to those already known, although I have no personal knowledge of perennial dreams. A physician in his thirties tells me that a yellow lion, concerning which he is able to give the precisest information, has often appeared in his dream life, from his earliest childhood up to the present day. This lion, known to him from his dreams, was one day discovered in Natura as a long-forgotten China animal. The young man then learned from his mother that the lion had been his favorite toy in early childhood, a fact which he himself could no longer remember. If we now turn from the manifest dream content to the dream thoughts which are revealed only on analysis, the experiences of childhood may be found to recur even in dreams whose content would not have led us to suspect anything of the sort. I owe a particularly delightful and instructive example of such a dream to my esteemed colleague of the Yellow Lion. After reading Nansen's account of his polar expedition, he dreamt that he was giving the intrepid explorer electrical treatment on an ice floe for the sciatica of which the latter complained. During the analysis of this dream, he remembered an incident of his childhood, without which the dream would be wholly unintelligible. When he was three or four years of age, he was one day listening attentively to the conversation of his elders. They were talking of exploration, and he presently asked his father whether exploration was a bad illness. 
He had apparently confounded racin, journey, trips, with racin, gripes, tearing pains, and the derision of his brothers and sisters prevented his ever forgetting the humiliating experience. We have a precisely similar case when, in the analysis of the dream of the monograph on the genus Cyclamen, I stumbled upon a memory, retained from childhood, to the effect that when I was five years old, my father allowed me to destroy a book embellished with colored plates. It will perhaps be doubted whether this recollection really entered into the composition of the dream content, and it may be suggested that the connection was established subsequently by the analysis. But the abundance and intricacy of the associative connections vouch for the truth of my explanation. Cyclamen, favorite flower, favorite dish, artichoke. To pick to pieces like an artichoke, leaf by leaf, a phrase which at that time one heard daily, apropos of the dividing up of the Chinese empire. Herbarium, bookworm, whose favorite food is books. I can further assure the reader that the ultimate meaning of the dream, which I have not given here, is most intimately connected with the content of the scene of childhood destruction. In another series of dreams, we learn from analysis that the very wish which has given rise to the dream, and whose fulfillment the dream proves to be, has itself originated in childhood, so that one is astonished to find that the child with all his impulses survives in the dream. I shall now continue the interpretation of a dream which has already proved instructive. I refer to the dream in which my friend R. is my uncle. We have carried its interpretation far enough for the wish motive, the wish to be appointed professor, to assert itself palpably, and we have explained the affection felt for my friend R. in the dream as the outcome of opposition to, and defiance of, the two colleagues who appear in the dream thoughts. The dream was my own. I may, therefore, continue the analysis by stating that I did not feel quite satisfied with the solution arrived at. I knew that my opinion of these colleagues, who were so badly treated in my dream thoughts, would have been expressed in very different language in my waking life. The intensity of the wish that I might not share their fate as regards the appointment seemed to me too slight fully to account for the discrepancy between my dream opinion and my waking opinion. If the desire to be addressed by another title were really so intense, it would be proof of a morbid ambition, which I do not think I cherish, and which I believe I was far from entertaining. I do not know how others who think they know me would judge me. Perhaps I really was ambitious, but if I was, my ambition has long since been transferred to objects other than the rank and title of Professor Extraordinarius. Whence, then, the ambition which the dream has ascribed to me, here I am reminded of a story which I heard often in my childhood, that at my birth an old peasant woman had prophesied to my happy mother, whose firstborn I was, that she had brought a great man into the world. Such prophecies must be made very frequently. There are so many happy and expectant mothers, and so many old peasant women, and other old women who, since their mundane powers have deserted them, turn their eyes toward the future and the prophetess is not likely to suffer for her prophecies. Is it possible that my thirst for greatness has originated from this source? But here I recollect an impression from the later years of my childhood, which might serve even better as an explanation. One evening, at a restaurant on the Prater, where my parents were accustomed to take me when I was eleven or twelve years of age, we noticed a man who was going from table to table and, for a small sum, improvising verses upon any subject that was given to him. I was sent to bring the poet to our table, and he showed his gratitude. Before asking for a subject, he threw off a few rhymes about himself, and told us that if he could trust his inspiration, I should probably one day become a minister. I can still distinctly remember the impression produced by this second prophecy. It was in the days of the bourgeois ministry. My father had recently brought home the portraits of the bourgeois university graduates, Herbst, Giegstra, Unger, Berger, and others, and we illuminated the house in their honor. There were even Jews among them, so that every diligent Jewish schoolboy carried a ministerial portfolio in his satchel. The impression of that time must be responsible for the fact that, until shortly before I went to the university, 
I wanted to study jurisprudence, and changed my mind only at the last moment. A medical man has no chance of becoming a minister. And now for my dream. It is only now that I begin to see that it translates me from the somber present to the hopeful days of the bourgeois ministry, and completely fulfills what was then my youthful ambition. In treating my two estimable and learned colleagues, merely because they are Jews, so badly, one as though he were a simpleton and the other as though he were a criminal, I am acting as though I were the minister. I have put myself in his place. What a revenge I take upon his excellency. He refuses to appoint me professor extraordinarius, and so in my dream I put myself in his place. In another case, I note the fact that although the wish that excites the dream is a contemporary wish, it is nevertheless greatly reinforced by memories of childhood. I refer to a series of dreams which are based on the longing to go to Rome. For a long time to come, I shall probably have to satisfy this longing by means of dreams, since, at the season of the year when I should be able to travel, Rome is to be avoided for reasons of health. Thus I once dreamt that I saw the Tiber and the bridge of Sant Angelo from the window of a railway carriage. Presently the train started, and I realized that I had never entered the city at all. The view that appeared in the dream was modeled after a well-known engraving, which I had casually noticed the day before in the drawing-room of one of my patients. In another dream someone took me up a hill and showed me Rome half-shrouded in mist, and so distant that I was astonished at the distinctness of the view. The content of this dream is too rich to be fully reported here. The motive, to see the promised land afar, is here easily recognizable. The city which I thus saw in the mist is Lübeck. The original of the hill is the Gleichenberg. In a third dream, I am at last in Rome. To my disappointment, the scenery is anything but urban. It consists of a little stream of black water, on one side of which are black rocks, while on the other are meadows with large white flowers. I notice a certain Herr Zucker, with whom I am superficially acquainted, and resolve to ask him to show me the way into the city. It is obvious that I am trying in vain to see in my dreams city, which I have never seen in my waking life. If I resolve the landscape into its elements, the white flowers point to Ravenna, which is known to me, and which once for a time replaced Rome as the capital of Italy. In the marshes around Ravenna, we had found the most beautiful water lilies in the midst of black pools of water. The dream makes them grow in the meadows, like the narcissi of our own Aussie, because we found it so troublesome to cull them from the water. The black rock so close to the water vividly recalls the valley of the Teppel at Carlsbad. Carlsbad now enables me to account for the peculiar circumstance that I ask Herr Zucker to show me the way. In the material of which the dream is woven, I am able to recognize two of those amusing Jewish anecdotes which conceal such profound and, at times, such bitter worldly wisdom, and which we are so fond of quoting in our letters and conversation. One is the story of the Constitution. It tells how a poor Jew sneaks into the Carlsbad Express without a ticket, how he is detected, and is treated more and more harshly by the conductor at each succeeding call for tickets and how, when a friend whom he meets at one of the stations during his miserable journey asks him where he is going, he answers, to Carlsbad, if my constitution holds out. Associated in memory with this is another story about a Jew who is ignorant of French, and who has expressed instructions to ask in Paris for the Rue Richelieu. Paris was for many years the goal of my own longing and I regarded the satisfaction with which I first set foot on the pavements of Paris as a warrant that I should attain to the fulfillment of other wishes also. Moreover, asking the way is a direct allusion to Rome, for, as we know, all roads lead to Rome. And further, the name Zucker, sugar, again points to Carlsbad, whither we send persons afflicted with the constitutional disease diabetes, Zucker Cronkite sugar disease. The occasion for this dream was the proposal of my Berlin friend that we should meet in Prague at Easter. A further association with sugar and diabetes might be found in the matters which I had to discuss with him. 
I long ago learned that the fulfillment of such wishes only called for a little courage, and I then became a zealous pilgrim to Rome. A fourth dream, occurring shortly after the last mentioned, brings me back to Rome. I see a street corner before me, and am astonished that so many German placards should be posted there. On the previous day, when writing to my friend, I had told him, with truly prophetic vision, that Prague would probably not be a comfortable place for German travelers. The dream, therefore, expressed simultaneously the wish to meet him in Rome instead of in the Bohemian capital, and the desire, which probably originated during my student days, that the German language might be accorded more tolerance in Prague. As a matter of fact, I must have understood the Czech language in the first years of my childhood, for I was born in a small village in Moravia, amidst a Slav population. A Czech nursery rhyme, which I heard in my seventeenth year, became, without effort on my part, so imprinted upon my memory that I can repeat it to this day, although I have no idea of its meaning. Thus in these dreams also there is no lack of manifold relations to the impressions of my early childhood. During my last Italian journey, which took me past Lake Trasimenus, I at length discovered, after I had seen the Tiber, and had reluctantly turned back some fifty miles from Rome, what a reinforcement my longing for the eternal city had received from the impressions of my childhood. I had just conceived a plan of traveling to Naples via Rome the following year, when this sentence, which I must have read in one of our German classics, occurred to me. It is a question which of the two paced to and fro in his room the more impatiently after he had conceived the plan of going to Rome, assistant headmaster Winkelmann, or the great general Hannibal. I myself had walked in Hannibal's footsteps. Like him, I was destined never to see Rome, and he too had gone to Campania when all were expecting him in Rome. Hannibal, with whom I had achieved this point of similarity, had been my favorite hero during my years in the gymnasium. Like so many boys of my age, I bestowed my sympathies in the Punic War not on the Romans, but on the Carthaginians. Moreover, when I finally came to realize the consequences of belonging to an alien race, and was forced by the anti-Semitic feeling among my classmates to take a definite stand, the figure of the Semitic commander assumed still greater proportions in my imagination. Hannibal and Rome symbolized in my youthful eyes the struggle between the tenacity of the Jews and the organization of the Catholic Church. The significance of our emotional life, which the anti-Semitic movement has since assumed, helped to fix the thoughts and impressions of those earlier days. Thus the desire to go to Rome has in my dream life become the mask and symbol for a number of warmly cherished wishes, for whose realization one had to work with the tenacity and single-mindedness of the Punic general, though their fulfillment at times seemed as remote as Hannibal's lifelong wish to enter Rome. The writer in whose works I found this passage was probably Jean-Paul Richter. And now, for the first time, I happened upon the youthful experience which even today still expresses its power in all these emotions and dreams. I might have been ten or twelve years old when my father began to take me with him on his walks, and in his conversation to reveal his views on the things of this world. Thus it was, he once told me the following incident, in order to show me that I had been born into happier times than he. When I was a young man, I was walking one Saturday along the street in the village where you were born. I was well-dressed, with a new fur cap on my head. Up comes a Christian, who knocks my cap into the mud and shouts, Jew, get off the pavement. And what did you do? I went into the street and picked up the cap, he calmly replied. That did not seem heroic on the part of the big strong man who was leading me, a little fellow, by the hand. I contrasted this situation, which did not please me, with another, more in harmony with my sentiments, the scene in which Hannibal's father, Hamilcar Barkas, made his son swear before the household altar to take vengeance on the Romans. Ever since then, Hannibal has had a place in my fantasies. In the first edition of this book, I gave here the name Hasdrubal, an amazing error which I explained in my psychopathology of everyday life. 
I think I can trace my enthusiasm for the Carthaginian general still further back into my childhood, so that it is probably only an instance of an already established emotional relation being transferred to a new vehicle. One of the first books which fell into my childish hands after I learned to read was Thiers' Consulate and Empire. I remember that I pasted on the flat backs of my wooden soldiers little labels bearing the names of the imperial marshals, and that at that time Massina, as a Jew Manasse, was already my avowed favorite. This preference is doubtless also to be explained by the fact of my having been born, a hundred years later, on the same date. Napoleon himself is associated with Hannibal through the crossing of the Alps and perhaps the development of this martial ideal may be traced yet farther back, to the first three years of my childhood, to wishes which my alternately friendly and hostile relations with a boy a year older than myself must have evoked in the weaker of the two playmates. The Jewish descent of the martial is somewhat doubtful. The deeper we go into the analysis of dreams, the more often are we put on the track of childish experiences which play the part of dream sources in the latent dream content. We have learned that dreams very rarely reproduce memories in such a manner as to constitute, unchanged and unabridged, the sole manifest dream content. Nevertheless, a few authentic examples which show such reproduction have been recorded, and I can add a few new ones, which once more refer to scenes of childhood. In the case of one of my patients, a dream once gave a barely distorted reproduction of a sexual incident, which was immediately recognized as an accurate recollection. The memory of it had never been completely lost in the waking life, but it had been greatly obscured, and it was revivified by the previous work of analysis. The dreamer had, at the age of twelve, visited a bedridden schoolmate, who had exposed himself, probably only by a chance movement in bed. At the sight of the boy's genitals, he was seized by a kind of compulsion, exposed himself, and took hold of the member of the other boy, who, however, looked at him in surprise and indignation, whereupon he became embarrassed and let it go. A dream repeated this scene twenty-three years later, with all the details of the accompanying emotions, changing it, however, in this respect, that the dreamer played the passive instead of the active role while the person of the schoolmate was replaced by a contemporary. As a rule, of course, a scene from childhood is represented in the manifest dream content only by an allusion, and must be disentangled from the dream by interpretation. The citation of examples of this kind cannot be very convincing, because any guarantee that they are really experiences of childhood is lacking. If they belong to an earlier period of life, they are no longer recognized by our memory. The conclusion that such childhood experiences recur at all in dreams is justified in psychoanalytic work by a great number of factors, which in their combined results appear to be sufficiently reliable. But when, for the purposes of dream interpretation, such references to childish experiences are torn out of their context, they may not perhaps seem very impressive, especially where I do not even give all the material upon which the interpretation is based. However, I shall not let this deter me from giving a few examples. With one of my female patients, all dreams have the character of hurry. She is hurrying so as to be in time, so as not to miss her train, and so on. In one dream, she has to visit a girlfriend. Her mother had told her to ride and not walk. She runs, however, and keeps on calling. The material that emerged in the analysis allowed one to recognize a memory of childish romping, and, especially for one dream, went back to the popular childish game of rapidly repeating the words of a sentence as though it was all one word. All these harmless jokes with little friends were remembered because they replaced other less harmless ones. In the original, this paragraph contains many plays on the word Hets, H-E-T-Z, hurry, chase, scurry, game, etc. 2. The following dream was dreamed by another female patient. She is in a large room in which there are all sorts of machines. It is rather like what she would imagine an orthopedic institute to be. She hears that I am pressed for time, and that she must undergo treatment along with five others. 
but she resists, and is unwilling to lie down on the bed, or whatever it is, which is intended for her. She stands in a corner and waits for me to say, It is not true. The others, meanwhile, laugh at her, saying it is all foolishness on her part. At the same time, it is as though she were called upon to make a number of little squares. The first part of the content of this dream is an allusion to the treatment and to the transference to myself. The second contains an allusion to a scene of childhood. The two portions are connected by the mention of a bed. The Orthopedic Institute is an allusion to one of my talks, in which I compared the treatment, with regard to its duration and its nature, to an orthopedic treatment. At the beginning of the treatment, I had to tell her that for the present I had little time to give her, but that later on I would devote a whole hour to her daily. This aroused in her the old sensitiveness, which is a leading characteristic of children who are destined to become hysterical. Their desire for love is insatiable. My patient was the youngest of six brothers and sisters, hence with five others, and as such her father's favorite, but in spite of this she seems to have felt that her beloved father devoted far too little time and attention to her. Her waiting for me to say, it is not trite, was derived as follows. A little tailor's apprentice had brought her a dress, and she had given him the money for it. Then she asked her husband whether she would have to pay the money again if the boy were to lose it. To tease her, her husband answered, yes, the teasing in the dream. And she asked again and again, and waited for him to say, it is not true. The thought of the latent dream, content may now be construed as follows. Will she have to pay me double the amount when I devote twice as much time to her? A thought which is stingy or filthy, the uncleanliness of childhood is often replaced in dreams by greed for money. The word filthy here supplies the bridge. If all the passage referring to her waiting until I say it is not true is intended in the dream as a circumlocution for the word dirty, the standing in the corner and not lying down on the bed are in keeping with this word. As component parts of a scene of her childhood in which she had soiled her bed, in punishment for which she was put into the corner, with a warning that Papa would not love her any more, whereupon her brothers and sisters laughed at her, etc. The little squares refer to her young niece, who showed her the arithmetical trick of writing figures in nine squares, I think, in such a way that, on being added together in any direction, they make fifteen. 3. Here is a man's dream. He sees two boys tussling with each other. They are Cooper's boys, as he concludes from the tools, which are lying about. One of the boys has thrown the other down. The prostrate boy is wearing earrings with blue stones. He runs towards the assailant with lifted cane in order to chastise him. The boy takes refuge behind a woman, as though she were his mother, who is standing against a wooden fence. She is the wife of a day laborer, and she turns her back to the man who is dreaming. Finally, she turns about and stares at him with a horrible look, so that he runs away in terror. The red flesh of the lower lid seems to stand out from her eyes. This dream has made abundant use of trivial occurrences from the previous day, in the course of which he actually saw two boys in the street, one of whom threw the other down. When he walked up to them in order to settle the quarrel, both of them took to their heels. Cooper's boys... This is explained only by a subsequent dream, in the analysis of which he used the proverbial expression to knock the bottom out of the barrel. Earrings with blue stones, according to his observation, are worn chiefly by prostitutes. This suggests a familiar doggerel rhyme about two boys. The other boy was called Marie, that is, he was a girl. The woman standing by the fence, after the scene with the two boys, he went for a walk along the bank of the Danube, and, taking advantage of being alone, urinated against a wooden fence. A little farther on, a respectably dressed elderly lady smiled at him very pleasantly, and wanted to hand him her card with her address. Since in the dream the woman stood as he had stood while urinating, there is an allusion to a woman urinating, and this explains the horrible look and the prominence of the red flesh, which can only refer to the genitals gaping in a squatting posture. 
seen in childhood, they had appeared in later recollection as proud flesh, as a wound. The dream unites two occasions upon which, as a little boy, the dreamer was enabled to see the genitals of little girls, once by throwing the little girl down, and once while the child was urinating. And, as is shown by another association, he had retained in his memory the punishment administered or threatened by his father on account of these manifestations of sexual curiosity. 4. A great mass of childish memories, which have been hastily combined into a fantasy, may be found behind the following dream of an elderly lady. On the Graben she sinks to her knees as though she had broken down. A number of people collect around her, especially cab drivers, but no one helps her to get up. She makes many vain attempts. Finally she must have succeeded, for she is put into a cab which is to take her home. A large, heavily laden basket, something like a market basket, is thrown after her through the window. This is the woman who is always harassed in her dreams, just as she used to be harassed when a child. The first situation of the dream is apparently taken from the sight of a fallen horse, just as broken down points to horse racing. In her youth she was a rider, still earlier she was probably also a horse. With the idea of falling down is connected her first childish reminiscence of the seventeen-year-old son of the hall porter, who had an epileptic seizure in the street and was brought home in a cab. Of this, of course, she had only heard, but the idea of epileptic fits, of falling down, acquired a great influence over her fantasies, and later on influenced the form of her own hysterical attacks. When a person of the female sex dreams of falling, this almost always has a sexual significance. She becomes a fallen woman, and for the purpose of the dream under consideration, this interpretation is probably the least doubtful, for she falls on the graben, the street in Vienna which is known as the concourse of prostitutes. The market basket admits of more than one interpretation. In the sense of refusal, German korb equals basket equals snub, refusal, it reminds her of the many snubs which she at first administered to her suitors and which, she thinks, she herself received later. This agrees with the detail. No one will help her up, which she herself interprets as being disdained. Further, the market basket recalls fantasies which have already appeared in the course of analysis, in which she imagines that she has married far beneath her station and now goes to the market as a market woman. Lastly, the market basket might be interpreted as the mark of a servant. This suggests further memories of her childhood of a cook who was discharged because she stole. She, too, sank to her knees and begged for mercy. The dreamer was at that time twelve years of age. Then emerges a recollection of a chambermaid who was dismissed because she had an affair with the coachman of the household, who, incidentally, married her afterwards. This recollection, therefore, gives us a clue to the cab drivers in the dream, who, in opposition to the reality, do not stand by the fallen woman. But there still remains to be explained the throwing of the basket, in particular, why it is thrown through the window. This reminds her of the forwarding of luggage by rail to the custom of fence turn in the country, and to trivial impressions of a summer resort, of a gentleman who threw some blue plums into the window of a lady's room, and of her little sister, who was frightened because an idiot who was passing looked in at the window. And now, from behind all this, emerges an obscure recollection from her tenth year of a nurse in the country, to whom one of the men-servants made love, and whose conduct the child may have noticed, and who was sent packing, thrown out, together with her lover. In the dream we have the expression, thrown into an incident which we have been approaching by several other paths. The luggage or box of a servant is disparagingly described in Vienna as seven plums. Pack up your seven plums and get out. Fensterln is the custom, now falling into disuse, found in rural districts of the German Schwarzwald, of lovers who woo their sweethearts at the bedroom windows, to which they ascend by means of a ladder enjoying such intimacy that the relation practically amounts to a trial marriage. The reputation of the young woman never suffers on account of Fenstrom, 
unless she becomes intimate with too many suitors. T.R. My collection, of course, contains a plethora of such patients' dreams, the analysis of which leads back to impressions of childhood, often dating back to the first three years of life, which are remembered obscurely or not at all. But it is a questionable proceeding to draw conclusions from these and apply them to dreams in general, for they are mostly dreams of neurotic and especially hysterical persons and the part played in these dreams by childish scenes might be conditioned by the nature of the neurosis, and not by the nature of dreams in general. In the interpretation of my own dreams, however, which is assuredly not undertaken on account of grave symptoms of illness, it happens just as frequently that in the latent dream content I am unexpectedly confronted with a scene of my childhood, and that a whole series of my dreams will suddenly converge upon the paths proceeding from a single childish experience. I have already given examples of this, and I shall give yet more in different connections. Perhaps I cannot close this chapter more fittingly than by citing several dreams of my own, in which recent events and long-forgotten experiences of my childhood appear together as dream sources. End of section 17 Recording by Lee Smalley